Well, good morning to you. My name is Becky. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. And uh, if you are new, maybe this is your first time to Cornerstone or newer, uh, welcome. We're glad you made the decision to join us this morning. Um, I'll be in the courtyard after service, and uh, we have a welcome area there, as well as a team of people who would love to meet you. If you are newer to Cornerstone, that's a great place to stop by. Um, And if you have questions about who we are as a church or are looking for ways to get further connected uh, in community here at Cornerstone, that's a great place to start. And so I hope you'll stop by. Uh, We also have a free gift just as a way of saying thanks for checking us out. Something that's coming up at the end of this month is something that probably applies to everyone in this room because uh, it involves something that all of us uh, interact with and deal with on a daily basis, and that's our money, our finances. At the end of the month, we have a, we have a great team of volunteers who are passionate about helping people uh, feel confident in how they can plan and navigate their finances and budgets and all of the intricacies that are involved in that. And uh, so they've put together this group. It's called the Financial Fitness Course. And uh, if you are interested in um, learning how you can uh, be more equipped to navigate finances and feel confident as you do that and uh, feel like you can grow in your ability to steward the finances that God has given you and use those in a way that um, are wise but also produce generosity in your life, um, that's a great place to start. And so you can scan that QR code uh, to get registered and find more info about that financial fitness course coming up. Uh, You know, this week, uh, the last five days, actually on Tuesday, uh, my staff and I were able to gather and just celebrate some things that God has done in the last few days uh, in and through this church. Um, in, in, in In the past uh, week, We've had a woman who's been a part of our safe parking program get moved into permanent housing, which is always an awesome thing. Yeah, you can, you can clap for that. Um, you don't have to golf clap for that, too. You can, like, concert mosh pit clap for that thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, such, it's such a fun thing to get to celebrate. Um, you know, the, as you can imagine, the people who are a part of our safe parking uh, are, are, are individuals who never imagined they'd be at, at that place. And for a lot of reasons, and each story is unique and different, um, but they find themselves here and living out of their vehicles and uh, needing to uh, to park here overnight to have a safe place where they could actually fall asleep and not have to worry about what they may encounter. Um, And uh, it's such a gift to be able to help walk alongside them and, uh, and, and give them hope in the midst of their circumstances. And so that was a super fun thing to celebrate. Another thing that we were able to share together is uh, this week we received a letter from an inmate who receives our sermons. Uh, we send out uh, hundreds of sermons every other week to inmates all throughout uh, our, uh, all throughout the nation. Uh, they're transcripts of our Cornerstone sermons, um, and, uh, and we're able to mail them to them so that they can have encouragement to read so that they continue to grow in their faith uh, while they're incarcerated. Uh, many of the inmates use that sermon transcript to lead uh, small group studies, Bible studies uh, in their prison. And, uh, and we received a letter from an inmate just sharing how grateful he is um, to have that resource, to be encouraged and grow spiritually in that way, as well as he's part of our, our pen pal team. And so we have a team of volunteers that uh, correspond with those who are incarcerated and trade letters back and forth um, and just are able to pray for them and encourage them in that time. And uh, this particular uh, man, he had, been, uh, he had been moved a couple times from, from facility to facility. And the facilities don't, like, reach out to us and say, like, hey, we know you've been sending a mail. You know, he's at a different place now, so let's go ahead and forward that. No, usually it just kind of ends communication when they uh, switch facilities. And so our, uh, our pen pal volunteer actually went out of her way to figure it out and, 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 and pursue where he was going so that those correspondences could continue. And he was blown away by that. Uh, someone who is often forgotten, often left out uh, because of his circumstances uh, being in prison. The fact that this volunteer pursued him <laughs> and took the initiative to continue to maintain relationship was a, was a, made a transforming impact on his life. Uh, and so that was a really cool thing to get to celebrate. And then also um, this week we received an email from a family who just, uh, who's been a part of Cornerstone for a few years, but they just moved out of the area. And so they sent uh, an email Um, to our leadership to share uh, the impact that Cornerstone's had on them. And I want to read a little bit of that email to you. Uh, He said this, he said, we've loved our time at Cornerstone and how you've kept Jesus and his love the main thing, always focusing on people and loving them, especially the forgotten and the marginalized. 
He said, we deeply align with your values and the interpretations on how to love others in the way of Jesus. We always walked away from sermons saying uh, to each other things like, I'm so thankful for Cornerstone, or this church is awesome, or this is how church should be. He then shared how his uh, wife struggles deeply with anxiety and the mental health series that we did this year and a couple years ago as well uh, helped her feel destigmatized and supported and encouraged by her church family. Uh, and then he said, he said this, he said, you've made a huge difference in our lives and reshaped our faith trajectory and our kids trajectory as well. And so we're so thankful. He said, you've reset the bar for what we're looking for and prioritizing when it comes to a church community. So then he asked, if you know any recommendations <laughs> of where we're at now, uh, please send them to us. Um, but uh, what a what a gift! I know it's it's as a as a pastor as a staff member it's encouraging to receive emails like that. But um, it just made me so proud of how the Holy Spirit is moving and impacting and transforming and healing and encouraging uh, people, changing lives um, through what He's doing in and through this church community. And so all of these things just made me super proud this week to get to be a part of what God's doing here. And none of that would be possible from uh, what we do on a Sunday to the way we serve our community and, and those on the margins to uh, the, our, our, our ministry to those who are incarcerated. None of that would happen without you and your giving. Uh, and so thank you for being a part of what God is doing here, not just with your time or your energy, but also with your finances. Uh, you'll hear me say this every week if you haven't taken that step to be a part of joining us in what God's doing in and through this church financially. I encourage you to do that. I love this church. I think it's a, a great uh, way to invest your resources for kingdom impact. And so I encourage you to sign up and be a part of our online recurring giving, uh, whether that's weekly or monthly, whatever that would look like for you and your family. Uh, don't hesitate to take that step and be a part of what God is doing through this church. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that uh, this morning we get to gather and sing praise to you. This morning we get to gather and fellowship with one another. This morning we get to gather and celebrate the tangible ways in which you're at work in and through this church family. What a gift, Lord. God, thank you for the transformation that is happening in people's lives, the transformation we get to be a part of. What a, what a gift, what a sacred responsibility we have as your people to, to be a part, invited in to the work you're doing in this world, to the love you're sharing, the hope you're bringing, the peace you're displaying. God, we ask that you would take these resources that you'd bless them, you'd multiply them, that we would continue to be a part of countless more stories of people who are impacted through the way we as a church family get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. God, we thank you for that opportunity. And we pray that everything we do would bring glory to you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Hey, we're continuing our sermon series uh, called The Deeply Formed Life. And uh, this series is based off of a book by that same title by a pastor named Rich Velotis. Uh, he's actually like, if I was a, you know, I'm a pastor, so sometimes pastors are like fangirls of other pastors. Rich Velotis is like my fangirl pastor. Um, I love listening to his, uh, his teaching and his input, his voice. He pastors the church in Queens. And uh, last summer, I was able to go to New York for the first time with my husband Garrett. And we went to his church on Sunday, and it was such a gift to, uh, to attend another church and uh, get to be um, just uh, poured into by, uh, by that congregation. And they're doing wonderful things um, in the Queens area. And, uh, and so I was excited that we got to dive into his book for this series. And this is week three now. The first couple of weeks have been uh, more internal and focused. And this is the week where we begin to look externally into how uh, what, what we're covering these five weeks are values that help us stay rooted in the way of Jesus. And so uh, so much of this, the spiritual journey of the Christian faith is outward and relationally. And so Pastor Chris is here um, to, uh, to talk through um, uh, how we pursue the way of Jesus when it comes to justice and racial reconciliation. Uh, he has a great sermon for us and a, and a really 
um, wonderful next step to encourage all of us into. Uh, but I also wanted to share another opportunity. You know, sometimes when we, uh, as the church, uh, have have conversations uh, around justice and uh, and racial reconciliation, it's easy to have it feel like a big conversation where there's a lot of things we don't know how to solve and to almost feel a little bit immobilized. Like, what do I even do? Where do I get started? Uh, and so there is a, a really cool group I wanted to let you know about uh, called the Jesus and Justice Collective. And it's actually a collective of local churches here in the East Bay and the South Bay. Cornerstone's a part of this. Uh, we have a wonderful person in our congregation named Carolyn who helps lead this um, for our church. And, uh, and it's a great way to connect with other Christians uh, around the topic of, of justice and racial reconciliation and, and learn and grow and pursue Jesus together. Um, and so they, the Jesus and Justice Collective does uh, usually quarterly events to help continue the conversation and stay engaged uh, in these important discussions. And for the fall, uh, the main thing they're going to be focusing on is a course, a seven-week course um, called Living Undivided. And, uh, and I think they just had the, the QR code up for that. Um, the, the cool thing about this is it's going to be hosted by uh, South Bay Community Church. Uh, and there's a few different churches who are going to get to be a part of this. Like I said, it's seven weeks, Thursday nights, um, virtually. And so this will be an opportunity uh, if, if you uh, are interested in, in being involved and in, in continuing to learn and grow uh, when it comes to justice and what that looks like um, for, for a Christian um, then this would be a great opportunity. And what I love is it's not just a space to continue the conversation, but it's going to be in the context of other churches coming together. And I think sometimes it's easy for churches to feel a little like us versus them, right? Like they do things a little differently than us, but really we're all the body of Christ. And so I think it's so beautiful that we get to build relationship with, uh, with, our, with our South Bay and other East Bay brothers and sisters uh, all, all in, around the unifying uh, focus of Jesus. And so you can check out our website, um, for more details on that, and uh, or you can scan the What's Coming Up code um, at the table tent, and that'll also give you info for the Living Undivided group. Uh, at this time, Pastor Chris is going to be out in just a second. Uh, like I said, he's got a great, a great sermon, and so I hope you pay attention, you lean in, and uh, thanks for joining us. So my topic this morning is overcoming prejudices, and um, I don't want there to be any sort of vibe of I'm talking down to you or I'm better than you in any way in regards to this. And so I'm going to do what I believe good leaders should do, and that is model um, confession. Confession is a spiritual practice that I think it's important for us all to model, and, um, and I'll go first in regards to the topic we're today of prejudice. Um, there is a people, a group of people that I really have a hard time with. I usually don't like this group of people. Um, their values are very different than the values that I hold dear. Um, their culture is a struggle for me. I don't like the way they dress. I don't like the food they serve uh, when they're at home. And this group of people is, of course, the Los Angeles Dodgers and all of their fans. They're just the worst. Um, I don't like them at all. So luckily, there's no Dodgers fans here, so this is a safe space. Wait, one? Oh my gosh, who let him in? I told security not to do that. Um, we're in week three of our uh, series, as, as Becky said, The Deeply Formed Life. First couple of weeks, we looked in, inward, and uh, now we're going to look at external habits that help us um, follow Jesus really, really well. And uh, I'm convinced that every person who has ever existed has struggled with prejudices, except for Jesus, of course. But the rest of us have this sin issue that we have to continually work through to rid ourselves of. The issue of prejudices has been a core issue throughout all of human history. We are all inclined to prefer people who are like us, who look like us, who share our values, who share our cultural preferences. People who are like us make us feel more comfortable and safer. It's easier for us to let our guard down and be ourselves when we're with people who are like us. 
Because of this, people throughout the world and throughout all of history, really, have lived in tribes of people who are of the same culture. The things that are preferred and normal for this tribe of people are quickly agreed to be the good way of doing things. As this tribe interacts with people from different tribes, they're immediately uncomfortable with the other tribe's different ways of doing things. The other tribe's ways are weird and not nearly as good as ours. And an us versus them mentality is always fostered as a way to protect our tribe's way of doing things. And even if there is an open hostility, which there oftentimes is throughout history, there's usually a belief that the other tribes are inferior to ours. Our ways are better because I like them more. The nation of Israel throughout its history, prior to the arrival of Jesus, deeply struggled with prejudice against other nations. Their original mission of being a blessing to every nation was oftentimes lost on them. Instead, they allowed their special status as God's chosen nation to develop a pride, a we're better than everyone else type of perspective that we see throughout the Old Testament. The Jewish perspective long before and then during the time of Jesus was distorted to the point that they considered all non-Jewish people to be unclean. Unclean is the, in the Jewish religion is, uh, it, it means it's bad or it's not pure enough to be associated with. Something unclean is something inferior to that which is clean. Dodgers fans would fit into the category of unclean if you follow the analogy. This is one of the primary sin issues that the ancient Israelites struggled with as a collective. And the law that they were given by God did not have the power to heal them of this sickness. The law, as we know, was meant to be a mirror that the nation of Israel held up to itself to reveal its sinfulness and need for a savior. It was meant to point the way to Jesus, which it did effectively. But it never had the power to help Israel get rid of its prejudices against other people groups. Only the gospel of Jesus has that power. Let's open up our Bibles or your Bible apps to Acts chapter 10. We're going to study the story of Peter and Cornelius the Centurion. Peter is one of the lead pastors of the Jerusalem church. Pentecost has already happened. The church is filled with the Holy Spirit. But the church is only made up of Jewish people who are following Jesus. Gentiles were still considered unclean and not welcome. And this must change in order for the kingdom of God to move forward in coming to earth. So God speaks to a Gentile man named Cornelius, and at the same time, he speaks to Peter in separate dreams to prepare them for their meeting together. Peter received a vision from the Holy Spirit that flipped upside down his theology of who the children of God were. The vision told Peter not to consider unclean what God had made clean. Peter is confused, but he starts to put the pieces together about what God is saying to him, and then those pieces more fully fall into place during his meeting at the home of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. We pick up the story in verse 24. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. 
Then Peter began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Uh, I love this story. This is just an awesome story. I mean, Peter was perhaps the most respected leader in the church at this point, Peter and James. I mean, he was doing great ministry, but his theology was wrong on this issue. And this is great news for us for a couple of reasons. The first thing is you don't have to have perfect theology to be effective in ministry. Peter had wrong theology in terms of who was included in the kingdom of God, which is a big part of theology, and he he was wrong. But the Spirit was still working through him in powerful ways to minister to Jewish people. And it's a reminder and to the reality of none of us have perfect theology. As much as we like to think we got the answers and have kind of figured it out, we don't. And as soon as we do, the Lord's going to humble us, and He's going to say, ah, you're way off on this one. And then we have to correct and adapt and adjust to a whole new way of thinking after we thought we had it figured out. None of us have perfect theology, but that is not going to stop the Holy Spirit from working powerfully through us. The second reason this is good news is that it's a reminder to us that As we follow Christ and as the Holy Spirit moves through us, the Holy Spirit is going to change our theology over time. The Holy Spirit is going to open our eyes to new realities and new truths that we had not seen before. And it's uncomfortable and it's unsettling, but it's such a critical part to how we grow closer to Christ. It's such an important part of the sanctification process of becoming more like Jesus. And so it teaches us and it reminds us to be humble and to be open-minded to what the Holy Spirit might continue to teach us. I love how in verse 34, um, where, where, where Peter says, um, I, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. I love the word favoritism. It's the perfect English word, in my opinion, for what Peter is trying to communicate. You see, the Jewish people absolutely believed that they were God's favorites and that God would show them now and for all time favoritism over all other people. They get special privileges that nobody else gets. This is deeply baked into the Jewish psyche at this time. My parents um, said they didn't have any favorites between Uh, me and my three siblings, Um, but we all knew that I was my mom's favorite, like by a mile. And um, if I, I can, I'm just imagining if I received a dream and the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, telling me that my mom loves all of us equally, I would be kind of ticked off because I love my special status as my mom's favorite. All my siblings will have a problem with this, but that's fine. Most of them aren't listening. Um, I empathize with Peter, though. I mean, it's, it's difficult to have your theology challenged and radically changed. It's unsettling. The theology we grew up with is way more comfortable. As we learn bits and pieces about the Jerusalem church during this time, one of the things we see is that it was hard for them to adjust to the inclusion of Gentiles into the community. Peter went back after his meeting with Cornelius and he told the Jerusalem church what had happened and they believed him and they agreed that this is of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean it was an easy transition practically. It's hard to just undo prejudices that had existed for their whole lives. It's hard work to overturn those prejudices for them and it is for us. A central theme of the gospel is the good news that Jesus is beginning the process of fixing all that is broken in this world. Heaven is in the process of coming to earth. Now, it's a slow process, but it's a promise we believe as followers of Jesus. It's also a promise that we are invited to participate in making a reality. Jesus' plan is to use us, his followers, to participate in the process of restoring this broken world. 
This is a central gospel truth that gives us hope and it gives us purpose. But it also confronts our sin nature. It it confronts some things in us that we would at times, if we're honest, prefer to keep the same. We talk about how broken the world is and we point fingers at this problem and that problem and, and it's all so messed up and we're often right. However, if you're like me, you secretly like parts of this broken world. I can be more comfortable in the brokenness. There are parts of the brokenness of this world that I really don't want to change. I want it to stay broken because it's just easier for me. I spoke earlier about how human nature causes us to gather into and live in tribes or cultures of people who are like us. This is a type of brokenness in our world that many of us at times don't want to change. We sometimes like the status quo. Have you heard of the term white flight before? There's a pattern throughout recent history in our country where white people will move out of a certain white community when the percentage of non-white people in that community gets to be too high. There's like a tipping point where The non-whites become too high a percentage, and the white people will begin moving in mass to another community that is predominantly white. Now, if you interviewed the people moving in this scenario, the white people moving in this scenario, pretty much none of them would say they're moving because of racial reasons. Uh, We would say that the schools are better in this new community, or we like the weather, or the restaurants, or a bunch of my friends now live over here and I want to be with my friends. Most people aren't explicitly moving because they don't like non-white people. However, this isn't just a white person problem. Every human who sins has the inclination to do this. I was told a couple years ago that the demographics of the Doherty Valley community in San Ramon is 95% Asian American. East Dublin has become similar. I remember a time when I was living in Sunnyvale over 20 years ago, and Cupertino was becoming almost exclusively an Asian American community. Now, please hear me out. I'm not trying to shame anyone about this. I'm as guilty of this as anyone. My family history is guilty of this as well. If you're white and you moved out because a community changed its demographics and you moved to a more white place, I get it. I've I've been there. Uh, If you're Asian and you're living in Doherty Valley, I'm not trying to shame you or say you should not be there or you should move. I'm simply making the point with current examples that we have this tendency, we have this inclination to live in communities of people who are like us, who are our tribe so to speak. However, the good news of Jesus' gospel compels us to work to change this. Part of God's plan to restore all things and bring heaven to earth slowly but surely is to break down the walls between cultures, between tribes, between ethnic or racial groups of people. We see God confront this sin in Peter and the early church in Jerusalem. And Peter and Paul had many public arguments about these issues. The Apostle Paul was arguing that in Jesus, God has now made a way for the Gentiles. And Peter was sticking with the old theology that Gentiles were still unclean until God spoke to Peter through a dream that we just studied, through the Holy Spirit, to correct him, teaching him that all people are welcome in the kingdom of God. Ethnicity, culture, race, none of that excludes anyone. All are welcome and have equal access to God's abundant grace. Though different, all cultures have a way of doing things that are beautiful and good. The gospel moves us to a place where we can appreciate the beauty of different ways of doing or thinking, understanding that it expands our understanding of God's beauty and the diversity that is within God's nature. As the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3, starting in verse 26, 
So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our broken world really likes these distinctions between people groups. These are distinctions that allow people to grab a hold of power and hold other people down. It allows people to keep their power. These distinctions are tools of oppression. Jews oppress Gentiles and Gentiles oppress Jews. It's back and forth with hatred and violence. Since sin entered the world, men have oppressed women, women in every culture. And the more there is a distinction between men and women, the easier it is to come up with justifications for the oppression of women throughout history. And then obviously, the free person oppresses the slave. Paul is highlighting a radical and often ignored or overlooked truth of the gospel. That when we are born again as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we step into a kingdom where there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, between man or woman, between slave or free. In God's kingdom, these distinctions go away. In the kingdom, there is no slave. There is only free. God's kingdom coming to earth will completely eliminate that evil distinction. In the kingdom, there is no man or woman. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't biological or physiological differences between men and women. But from the perspective of purpose or value or mission, there is no distinction between man and woman. In the kingdom, there is no Jew or Gentile, no difference. Now, skin color may stay different. You might see a physical difference, but in every other way, there is no distinction at all between Jew or Gentile. For some of us at times, this doesn't hit as great news because sometimes we like the distinctions. We like buying cheap clothing on Sheen or Timu. It saves us a ton of money. Let's not think about how some of the clothes could be made by slaves. Or we like the distinct gender roles because it's what we grew up with. Familiarity breeds comfort. Change is disorienting and difficult. Or we like our ethnic culture and are really uncomfortable around people from other cultures. These hesitations, these hang-ups to the full implications of the gospel of heaven coming to earth were hesitations that the church in Jerusalem was also struggling with. It's why they had a hard time with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was way too radical for the Jerusalem church, and that's why they fought. Paul was having women lead house churches. Paul was putting former slaves in leadership roles. Paul was saying that not only are Gentiles children of God, but they don't have to follow the regulations that Jews thought all children of God were required to follow, most notably circumcision. Women, slaves, Gentiles helping to lead the way, this Paul guy is crazy. However, as the Holy Spirit has been moving in our community and in our hearts as a church, we've seen so much positive change here at Cornerstone. We've become transformed to the ways of Jesus, which is what's happened to the Jerusalem church. After Peter had his Holy Spirit-driven interaction with Cornelius, their church began to embrace the implications of the kingdom of heaven breaking more fully through to restore this broken world and the broken distinction between groups of people. So what is the strategy that we see employed by Jesus and the apostles in the early church to bring heaven to earth by breaking down prejudices and distinctions? How did they, how did they do it? Well, the best way I see Jesus in the early church tackle this problem was to put different types of people 
together into community with each other where they had to live life together in close proximity. We see Jesus do this to varying degrees with the 12 disciples. Uh, Even though all 12 disciples were Jewish, many of them would never have associated with each other because they come from different economic classes. And two of them would have despised each other. Uh, Simon the Zealot is well known for his hatred of Rome and anything that would support Rome. And then Matthew, the Roman tax collector, is literally, his job is to support Rome. You know, these two people would be mortal enemies until Jesus brings them together into the same missional community. Expand beyond the 12 disciples into the group of roughly 120 disciples that followed Jesus around throughout his ministry, and you have a diversity of economic classes as well as men and women living together in missional community, breaking down walls of distinction that the kingdom of God requires us to do. And then fast forward to the early church, and we have plenty of examples of different ethnic groups living together as part of the growing home church network that was spreading throughout Asia Minor and beyond. Read the end of some of Paul's letters where he thanks his team that consists of men, women, Africans, former slaves, Greeks, Romans, Jews, and Gentiles living together in missional community and learning how to adjust to the different preferences of each culture. So we have the primary action step from Jesus' words and actions and from the model of the early church. The best way to overcome prejudice and break down the distinctions that are part of our broken world is to live together with different types of people in missional community. That's the biblical prescription to the problem. As I was um, preparing this message over the last couple weeks, I became really moved and actually a little bit emotional about the ways the Holy Spirit has moved in our church the last several years. It wasn't too long ago that we had an all-white male leadership team. It wasn't long ago that our church was predominantly a white church. However, about 12 years ago, God clearly called us to be as diverse as the communities around our campuses. Pastor Steve Madsen, our founding pastor, and the rest of us felt a conviction from the Holy Spirit that this was a critical part of living out the gospel in our neighborhoods. I look back and I am so grateful now for what God has done in our church Not that we've arrived, we can continue to improve, and we should continue to improve, but we look so much more like how the demographics in our communities look, and we look so much more like how heaven will look. Our church board is diverse, our staff is more diverse, and our congregation is so much more diverse, praise God. And it wasn't always an easy journey along the way. And we had a lot of people leave our church because our push to include all people and to include various cultural preferences in the way we do church um, was too difficult for some. And so they left. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm amazed at what God has done in us and through us, and I couldn't be more proud of our church. And then after God moved us towards kingdom diversity, He called us to move in the direction of developing missional communities. And as our team was thinking about the next steps for this particular message this morning, and what do we call people to after this message, uh, how, how do we get people from different cultures to live together, we were immediately struck by God's provision for us. We don't have to manufacture some next steps and like rush to last minute try to coordinate groups of people that can begin to get together this next week who are different from each other and like, okay, you guys are going to start to live together in community. Like we didn't have to force any next steps. God has already led us to that next step and we've been doing it. Joining a neighborhood church has been that next step and is that next step this week. It's the same step that Jesus offered those following him. 
It's the next step that the early church asked of all followers of Jesus. Live life together with all different types of people in your neighborhood and in a way that is on mission towards your neighborhood. God has placed every single one of us in the neighborhoods we are in for specific reasons that are much bigger than ourselves. There are eternal reasons why you live where you live. It's not just because of your job or the schools. It's because God wants to continue to use you to bring his kingdom more and more into your neighborhood by the way you live life with others. What's amazing and, and just so wonderful about living in the Bay Area is that most of our neighborhoods are pretty diverse. There are a few neighborhoods that lean heavily into one ethnic group, but most of our neighborhood churches will position you to have the opportunity to begin to live life with people who are different than you. One of the things about neighborhood church that, um, that has helped me so much in my walk with Jesus is that I didn't get to choose who is in my neighborhood church. You see, my whole church life, um, I've been able to choose like who's in my Bible study or who's in my community group. I had some control over it and I'd usually curate it so that it's people that I enjoy. Um, I don't like, I try to avoid like extra grace required people because I have limited time and if I'm gonna commit to this, like I need to get the most out of it, right? I need to be able to, maximize my time, and I want it to be with people who I'm going to enjoy being with. However, that habit I had was not helping me fully step into the good news that breaks down walls between cultures and helps me overcome the prejudices that keep me from loving all people as well as I can. For me, Getting to know and love people in my neighborhood who I previously would have never been in community with is exactly what I needed to help me to continue to grow in my walk with Christ. Even people who are Dodgers fans, you guys. Like the gospel stretches us that far. (laughs) Yes, it's easier to be in a group of people uh, that that are like you. But it's so much more like the kingdom of heaven to be living life with all sorts of different types of people because it chips away and eventually it eliminates our prejudices and the distinctions that have kept us living in ways that are not like Jesus. My kitchen counter on the Sundays where we host Neighborhood Church is filled with foods from cultures all over the world. Or some, some months, it's hosted at another home, and everyone has to take off their shoes because of the different cultural expectations of that home. And these may seem like small things, but they're not. The differences that exist become so much less when we experience them in community. We begin to appreciate all people, even people who have cultural preferences that are different from our own. And this is such an important step to living the deeply formed life that Jesus has for us. So my encouragement to you, if you're able, is to join your local neighborhood church. It's been transformational to me and to so many of you I know. Um, I understand that if you've never been to a neighborhood church before, it can be intimidating, it can be a little bit scary, it's an intimate setting, there's more vulnerability in a neighborhood church setting. And so there's like a hump to get over. But as so many have experienced, as it's something that if you decide to stick to it for a while, um, the blessings are so numerous. And it's something that we've committed to as a church because we believe in our cultural context and the challenges that our culture faces of loneliness, of isolation. In addition to the biblical example and the example of the early church set before us, that this is one of the best ways that we can be faithful to what God has called us to in our time and place. And so I pray that you, if you haven't, would have the courage to give it a go. It's not easy. We're not saying it's going to be easy. Um, it's never perfect, um, but it's worth it. And, um, and so we're going to continue to encourage it. 
And, uh, and my prayer is that at some point you'll be able to step into that next step and it'll be a tremendous blessing to you um, as we move forward. We do have QR code on the screen. We have QR code at the tables or in your little living room areas. Um, and if you want to scan that QR code, it's going to take you to a web page that lists out all the neighborhood churches by neighborhood. There's a whole bunch in Livermore that are kind of condensed, but you should be able to figure out what neighborhood is yours and you can register for that neighborhood church, which is meeting next Sunday morning. We're all gathering in homes uh, throughout the East Bay. Every campus does it. And, um, and so there is a home that was ready to host you and have an amazing experience. We kind of do brunch um, together. People, everyone brings food, a little bit of food, and we have brunch together and an amazing time. And so hopefully you can register and join us for that next Sunday morning. And we're going to be talking about um, the next topic in this sermon series is uh, about living missionally in your community, in your neighborhood. So it's perfect for um, that type of gathering setting. So, so I'm really looking forward to that. So I'd encourage you to sign up um, and to engage in that. And let's, let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much, Lord. And we, um, we acknowledge and we are so thankful how gracious you are to us. Lord, there are Uh, are so many times where we have our theology wrong. We misunderstand you and what you're doing. And in those moments, you are still gracious to us. You still move in our lives. You still use us to do things that are impactful, that are eternal. Lord, there are times in our lives where we are struggling with prejudices. And even in those moments, your grace abounds even more. You don't condemn us, you don't reject us, you don't shame us when we're off track, when we're wrong, or when we're struggling. Lord, your love overwhelms us. Your grace always covers us. By the blood that you shed on the cross, we know that we always have your grace, we always have your forgiveness, and we always have your spirit helping us to grow and change and improve. And we are so, so grateful for that. As, Lord, we learn how to live together in community with each other, not be like, hey, I saw you at church, you go to the same church as me, but we literally are living life together as neighbors and family and friends with a vulnerability and a depth that is unlike anything the world has to offer. Like, the world cannot offer what your Holy Spirit designs for each of us in terms of the depth of community that you call the church to be, Lord. And so we pray that you would empower us by your spirit, that you would give us the strength to do that, that we would overcome the challenges that will come our way when we try to do that, Lord, and that we would be faithful and bold and brave and obedient to all that you've called us to do as your followers. Jesus, we love you so much, and we pray this all in your powerful name. Amen. Well, we have, um, we have a discussion on the screen, discussion question. Uh, we have little living room setups and tables designed for discussion after the service. And so our question for this morning is, describe a time in your life when you were exposed to a different culture, a culture very different from your own, and how did that experience affect you? Um, hopefully you have a little bit of time to discuss and get to know those around you. Um, but we love you and uh, have a great Sunday.